All right. Thanks so much for having me. My name is Emily Silverman, and I'm an internist at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. I'm also the founder of The Nocturnist, which is an independent medical storytelling community uh, that I actually started up when I was a resident here at UCSF. And I'll be talking for a few minutes about the project I've been working on over the last few months called Stories from a Pandemic. And then after that, I will turn the mic over to my colleague, Dr. Ashley McMullen, who's going to speak about a similar audio series that we're working on together called Black Voices in Healthcare. So before I dive in, I just wanted to provide a little bit of context about the organization that I run, which is called The Nocturnist. So The Nocturnist was really born out of the burnout that I was experiencing during residency, as I feel many residents and even attending physicians are experiencing today, um, really just feeling like I wanted a space where healthcare workers could come together and examine themselves, pause, take a breath, find space to explore, find space to play, tell stories about ourselves, tell stories about our work, and uh, in January 2016, we did our first live show with a very, very small audience of 40 people and picked up a lot of traction. I think there was just a lot of hunger in the medical community to be engaging with ourselves and with our work through this more humanistic and narrative lens. I think especially as um, computers have been encroaching on the doctor-patient interaction and just feeling like um, sometimes medicine can be really creatively stifling, which is unfortunate since I feel like medicine has the potential to be such a creative space. And I think a lot of COVID actually has brought out some of that creativity and innovation. But at the time, really craving uh, this sort of communal uh, catharsis. So fast forward four years and we were able to really build on that momentum and um, pre-COVID in January, we're fortunate enough to sell out the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco. It's a 700 seat theater. Um, we filled it up and had uh, physicians and other healthcare workers telling stories about themselves on stage. Uh, around that time, we were also doing a podcast spinoff. And so the way that the podcast was working at the time was the first half of the podcast was a live story clip from one of our live shows. And then it would be followed by a conversation between me and the storyteller. Um, so this is what we were doing. We were actually in our third season of this podcast uh, when COVID-19 hit in March. And we just dropped everything. And our team looked around at ourselves and we were like, wow, our organization has never made more sense than it does right now. Um, because we had really been spending four years taking care of the hearts and souls of physicians. And we saw that we were facing um, what in many ways is one of the biggest plot twists uh, in medical history and really wanted to make ourselves available to serve our community and to continue to be a space and an outlet for self-expression and for healing and for community and for well-being. So what do we do? Uh, so what we ended up doing is putting out a call for audio diaries. And this was different from what we had been doing before because previously we were asking um, healthcare workers to come into our team and craft like a perfect 10 minute story with opening opening scene and an arc and stakes and conflict. But this this was like, come home from work, turn off the lights, talk into your phone, don't prepare, don't write, don't think, just tell us what's happening, tell us what's on your mind. And so we put out this call and within about 40 or within about uh, 24 hours, we had 50 people sign up. And then over the course of the next few weeks, we actually ended up having over 200 people sign up to participate in this project. People from all across the United States, a lot of physicians, but also some nurses. We had a chaplain, we had a DME, uh, medical equipment truck driver sign up to participate, all sorts of voices. And we effectively, um, received, I want to say, uh, 700 audio clips between the months of March and May. And so our team would sit and just listen to these audio clips, listen to what was going on on the ground, um, and started to produce these episodes, podcast episodes. Um, and we produced them in the style of Saturday Night Live, where basically every Tuesday we would release an episode, and then the clock would reset, and we would look at the material that had come in the week before and try to pull out themes um, that were coming up, try to... Um, 
highlight contradictions that were coming up and really just uh, keep our finger on the pulse of what was happening on the ground and pump out these episodes every week. Um, and it was great because the audio diarists who were contributing could hear their own voices on the show in real time and could hear the voices of strangers across the country who were going through this experience alongside them. Um, and what was also interesting about it is that each audio clip itself isn't necessarily a full story. There are these moments these slices of life and when you weave them together into a tapestry, this larger story starts to emerge of what is it to be a healthcare worker, um, you know, during COVID-19. So this is what we did. <clears throat> and the question comes up, why is this important? Why is storytelling so important during a pandemic? And I think in medicine, a lot of us tend to focus on the science and the data, and that is hugely important. I think um, even some of the other speakers today are showing us the importance of epidemiology and tracking and evidence and, and all of that. But I also think it's really important for us as a medical profession to just take a breath and just locate ourselves in the chaos of what is happening right now and ask ourselves, how are we moving through this moment? What is coming up for us? Where are we sad? Where are we angry? Where are we frustrated or lonely? Uh, where are the moments where we're finding joy, where we're finding hope, where we have moments of triumph? Um, where are the moments of complexity and contradiction? Um, for example, we had a diarist send in a clip from Indiana and his wife was undergoing chemo for cancer and he was a pulmonary critical care physician and um, wasn't gonna go in to take care of COVID patients because he wanted to protect his wife who was immunosuppressed and he was really conflicted about it. I mean, on the one hand, he was relieved and he was glad that he didn't have to go in and put himself exposed to this virus. On the other hand, he was having like FOMO and you know, kind of wanted to like jump in and lend a hand. And, and it was all of those feelings layered on top of themselves simultaneously. And I think um, what's really been great about this project is we've been able to give voice to that emotional complexity and give people the opportunity to really metabolize this experience and uh, create meaning out of this experience. Storytelling is a, is a very powerful tool for making meaning. Um, and also to do that communally, to do that as part of, of a larger group, um, particularly a group of other healthcare workers who kind of get it and understand what it is to, to be going through this um, is really powerful. So just briefly, I just wanted to touch on some common themes that came up uh, as we were listening to this audio, since people ask a lot about that. Early on, um, there was a lot that we were hearing about fear, about uncertainty, about bracing for this tidal wave. Um, there was a lot coming in about leadership and what it means to be an effective leader during this time. How do we communicate with each other about new policies that are ever shifting? Um, who were the people who felt they were being led well? Who were the people who did not feel like they were being led well? Um, there was a lot about loneliness and social isolation, the deep need that we have uh, to touch each other and to connect to each other face to face. Um, there was a lot that came up around the concept of sacrifice, um, around the identity of being a physician and the rhetoric that was being used in the mass media about doctors and nurses. About all of these military metaphors that are being tossed around, like going to battle or being drafted. Um, so that came up a lot. Um, questions of guilt, questions of how do we assign value to things in healthcare, um, questions of health equity, as we saw how this pandemic ripped through our most vulnerable patient populations in this nation. Um, and then toward the end, questions of where do we go from here? How do we use this historical moment as a fulcrum to really pivot and, and rewrite the future and give us a different American healthcare, one that is more equitable, one that is more sustainable, one that is more healthy. Um, so in terms of where we're going from here, um, we're gearing up. So we did the 10 podcast episodes, um, which you can listen to. It's an audio documentary series on our website, uh, thenocturnist.com. And then we have an interactive story map where you can um, listen to the stories by geographic location. Um, and we're currently in conversations with a major cultural Cultural institution, which I can't name at this moment, but I'm um, talking about enshrining this audio library uh, as a historical document to be preserved, which can be accessed by historians in 100 years, which I also think will be really important. Um, and we're going to continue to collect audio. So if you or anyone you know is interested in contributing, please feel free to reach out. We're going to produce a part two of this series. Um, 
And so maybe I'll just pause there. I think one of the best ways to really get a flavor of what we're doing is to listen to an audio clip. And so I've selected this clip. Um, it's just under three minutes. It's short. Um, thank you for transitioning to the slide. This is our beautiful art that was done for the project by illustrator Lindsay Mound. And I might just ask that you take a breath, close your eyes, listen to the story. This is a clip that was sent in from an internal medicine physician named Kat from Michigan a couple of months ago. And I think you'll see hearing the clip uh, just how much she brings us into her world, into the hospital. And so let's roll the clip. Today is April 26th. It's a Sunday, five o'clock. And yeah, I'm in the hospital even though I'm supposed to be off, but I don't care today. Because I am, I am walking through the basement and I'm looking at a unit of convalescent plasma. Like I'm holding it in my hand and walking it to the ICU right this minute because my hospital is lucky enough to be one of the sites for research that we've got something in our arsenal that we think really works. And it's really cool. I've watched everybody perk up at each stage of this process of Hey, we got registered as a site. Hey, we consented and enrolled our first candidate. But now that now that it's here, now that I'm looking at it, it feels going up so much better. Um, when I go in to consent another person in another room while we're waiting on it to thaw, I feel hope. We feel energized, and so I think that's a, what we all need right now because the, the hope and the energy is, is losing it. But, you know, it's, it's those little things. The, the patient that we discharged from the rehab unit to go back to his family, who was up and walking and gonna be like his normal self, that, that was a win too. That was a good one. So, yeah. I'm really excited to walk through the ICU doors and go hand this off to the nurse who's going to hang it for our really sick, prone, ventilated patient who is happens to be one of my primary care patients through sheer dumb luck. Today's a good day. I don't mind being at the hospital today. left the hospital and the sun is out it's gorgeous outside but the best thing the very best thing is the refrigerated trucks are gone none of us wanted to talk about why they were there in the first place and we're still gonna lose patience there's no question there but things are starting to feel more like we can we can handle the bad stuff and the, there's more good stuff. No, so there we go. It. I'm back. <laughs> um, so that gives you a taste of, of what, what we've been collecting, the type of audio we've been collecting. If you're interested in learning more, you can visit our website, uh, thenocturnist.com. And thank you for your time and attention. And uh, I'll just turn it over now to uh, Dr. Ashley McMullen, who will talk about our other series, Black Voices in Healthcare. Great. Thank you. Great. All right, thank you, Emily. Um, so yeah, the, the next series of The Nocturnist has been um, Black Voices in Healthcare. And really this, the idea for this project um, came out of the, or in the wake of the George Floyd mur murder, um, which was at that time just the latest in a series of examples of anti-Black racism in our society. And while this isn't new, it definitely hits uh, differently in the context of a 
pandemic that is uh, certainly disproportionately impacting communities of color, especially um, African American communities. And so recognizing that, you know, in this moment specifically um, in, in healthcare, what we need is not only a, um, a greater awareness of this issues of these issues, um, what we need is empathy and uh, certainly empathy across differences. And stories are just one avenue to do that. And so that is um, kind of the motivation behind um, launching this series. And so I actually um, would love to just go ahead and transition into a clip um, from one of our episodes. Again, similar to the last one, it's gonna be just under three minutes and then um, I'll jump back on with a couple comments after that. I still remember the day I met her on rounds. I'd taken over a service on the inpatient HIV service, and she had been in the hospital about 30 days. Young girl, advanced HIV AIDS, battling a couple of opportunistic infections, and she was starting to finally get better. She was being weaned off oxygen and was starting to regain her appetite. We started her on antiretroviral medicines in the hospital. I remember meeting her and she's probably 24, 25, slightly older than my kids. And all I could remember was how little she looked and how much hair she had. Her hair was big, it was huge, but it was matted. And she'd been in the hospital, she'd been in the ICU. And through all of that, the transfers back and forth, no one looked at her hair. I've spent many years in the hospital. I'm used to bringing in little hair ties and getting out the little rubber bands on my wrist to give to a patient. Because I know black women, our hair is important. Our hair is part of what defines us. And when people are in the hospital, a lot of times that just falls by the wayside. The little bowls at the bedside with the one shaving stick and little tiny comb doesn't cut it. It never has, it never will. And there's nothing like having your hair done to make you feel like you're getting better. But this one girl, well, young lady, was just finally getting better. And I told myself I would braid her hair. I'd never done that for a patient, but there was something about her. She had this fight in her eyes and she was gonna get better. And I know that just feeling better about how she looks would help. So I asked her how she liked her hair and she said, oh, she always got her hair done, twists, braids, different things. So Saturday morning, we got done our rounds it's pretty early, we didn't have a lot of admits, we were pre-call, and I just went into her room, and I said, hey, do you want me to braid your hair? She was surprised. She said, doctor, you're going to? I said, sure. I said, I've been braiding my sister's hair for a long time. I have three younger sisters. I have two daughters. Both my daughters used to fall asleep with me braiding their hair. I like to tell myself that my hands are, are soft. I sat by the bedside, and I braided her hair into eight conrows to the back. She looked fabulous. Awesome. So what you guys um, heard in addition to that clip, or what you saw, or what you're seeing now, sorry, is the um, beautiful artwork we have for our illustrator for this series, um, which is a, a piece by Ashley Florial. Uh, so in that clip, it's actually one of my favorite stories of the series, um, but you hear from a black physician who's caring for um, a black patient who's been ill for quite some time and uh, the idea being that she's able to establish this connection um, that kind of sees the patient beyond just a series of illnesses, but really uh, allows her to touch on that piece of her humanity and, and recognizing that hair is a big part of uh, black identity, especially for, for black women. And so um, being able to uh, do her hair played a role in that patient's healing. And again, just elevating um, the, the humanity that uh, can sometimes be absent in medicine. And so really the, the hope for the series is that um, it allows listeners just a greater proximity to uh, the Black experience through the lens of Black healthcare workers. 
and highlighting not just the, the pains and, and difficulties that come with um, being Black in our society, but also the, the joys and the strengths and, and the triumphs and also just the, the complex humanity that really connects us across differences. Um, and specifically as, as people who work in healthcare and are working during this, uh, this unique time in the context of COVID-19. And so again, hoping that um, by listening, by having this proximity, by gaining under better understanding and better empathy, it can start to lower some of the barriers to having the, the difficult but necessary conversations uh, that we need for, for lasting change in this moment and, and going forward. Um, so with that, I'm, I wanna you know, turn it back over to you, Bob, and hopefully have some time for questions. Maybe if Emily can come uh, take down the slide and if Emily can come back on and it was time for just a question or two. Uh, thank you both. It's incredibly powerful and the whole series has been has been just great. Um, you know, I remember when Emily started this, I remember we had a conversation about this and on a drive from one of the hospitals to the other. Um, you had some sort of dreams about what it would become. Can you talk about sort of whether you're reaching them and what if, if three to five years from now, this even exceeded uh, where it is now, what would that look like for you? And maybe for both of you actually. Sure, I would just love for the Nocturnist to be the place to go to access really compelling, provocative stories about what it means to be a healthcare worker um, in the United States. Uh, I almost dream of it being like a This American Life for medicine specifically. And I think what's really unique about this project is it's by healthcare for healthcare. Um, when I went into this project, I wasn't a journalist um, and I was an MD and it was really born out of my own hunger to create the space for MDs and then later expanded to RNs and other healthcare workers. And I find that when people share audio with me, the fact that um, I and a lot of the others on the team are doctors, like there's sort of this different way of talking to each other. Um, I just noticed that when physicians speak to journalists or the, or the lay press, there's this like filter there. But when you're talking to another doctor, you kind of get each other, as I said, um, and you can talk in a certain language. And I think that's one thing that makes our project really special is the way that we've been able to build that trust and camaraderie um, and really not be afraid to explore our own vulnerability. And I think to do that with another physician organization as a guide uh, would be really powerful. Great, great. Ashley, any, what's, what's your dreams for this? Yeah, well, I guess my first dream is that we can do live shows at some point again, and that will be um, that will be exciting. I think, you know, as far as my, my hope, um, especially with the series, is that it's just one, um, uh, one catalyst to integrate more narrative into how we practice, both in the way that we, how we see our patients and also the narratives that we tell among our colleagues to, again, kind of get us out of these professional silos and, and recognize that, there's so much humanity and so much uh, depth in the storytelling experience that happens in medicine. And I think that just makes us better uh, at what we do. Well, thank you both. It's really uh, powerful. And I just, I mean, throughout this entire thing, it is, uh, it's increasingly clear that the number of lenses that we have to use to look at this and get it right is, uh, is, is extraordinarily large. And if you're just looking at it through the quote scientific lens, you're missing a ton and just, you know, the power of, of what you've shown us today is, uh, is, is really demonstrates that quite clearly. And I hope people will go to the site and, and listen and contribute. And, uh, and also, uh, I hope we have live shows sooner rather than later. So thank you both for being here. Let me thank all the speakers. Again, a reminder that next week for UCSF folks, our grand rounds will be replaced by a presentation at the same time by the campus looking at the future of Parnassus. We'll take a couple weeks off after that, including the production team, as you see here. They get a little bit of break. And we'll be back on Thursday, September 10th uh, with another in the series. We'll post this tonight uh, on YouTube at about 7.30 Pacific, and uh, we'll have a good copy of the, uh, of the first video. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, stay safe and, uh, and sane. And uh, hopefully we're moving closer to the end as we go forward. Uh, we'll see you in a few weeks. Thanks so much.